And look, Nigel, put a bit of chrome on it, put some fins on it. This, to me, was the original Shelby Cobra. The nice thing is, once you're going, you can do this. You know, it's always a good day in the Cotter household when my phone rings and I look, oh, it's Jay Leno. Hey, Jay. Tom, you'll never guess what I just found. And it's happened over and over and over again. Jay, thanks for inviting us well, here. Thanks, thanks. That shows you the age we're living now. I'm right here, but he still has to communicate through the phone. Did you see that? I mean, he's like a 12-year-old now. Well, you told me what it was. I thought this would be an interesting one because this is not technically a barn find. This was a car that was in a shipping crate in the desert. Well, I remember when you told me you found it. Right. So, so have you done anything with it or just brought it right here? The engine was not in it. Um, this is a car, it's been a race car its whole life, at least since 1959 or 60. A Junior's House of Color painted the candy apple red. Uh, Tony Nancy did the interior. It was you know, an interesting car. It's, I said to the guy, do you have the engine? He goes, well, yeah, yeah. He said, I had it rebuilt in Germany. And I went, oh, yeah, right, okay. But I saw the crate, the, the crate rather, it was German. We brought it here, we took it out of the crate. There was assembly lube over everything. We put it on my engine dyno. It made a little over 200 horsepower, 210, 220, something like that. And it was rebuilt in Germany. And you didn't have to do anything? Not really. I mean, we checked everything. Yeah. What had happened was you have a, a lambskin kind of diaphragm in the fuel system and running on the dyno, it ran fine, but when you got up to revs, it got porous or had porosity, anyway, it would lean out. We realized if we hadn't had that dyno, I probably would have damaged the engine running it too lean. Right, you know? right. So, okay, we fixed that, modern replacement. Put the engine, did the transmission, did the brakes, did everything. The nice thing is, well, if you're going, you can do this. <laughs> you know, and there's no fitted luggage. It's just fun to drive as an old car. Uh, what, what, we did, what year is it? It is a 55. You see the metal, we just put shellac clear coat over all the metal, so it wouldn't deteriorate anymore. Yeah. But if you had bought this car in 1959 to 61, this is probably what it would look like. You probably would have paid $1,500 or $1,800 for it, because it's only a few years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, I worked for a Mercedes dealer in the late 60s, and we bought one for $5,000, sold it for $7,500, and my boss thought, oh my God, because 2500 was a lot of money. That was like $25,000 today. Right. So that's what's kind of fun about it. You can use it for its intended purpose, just to drive and have fun. I mean, it would probably cost a half a million to strip it, go through the chassis, check all the welds, make sure everything is exactly... But it's, it wouldn't drive any better or stop any better. And then you couldn't have the fun with it. You couldn't sit on well, it. Well, it's fun just to drive it. And, you know, when you go to car shows, kids want to sit in. Hey, get away from me. You don't have to do that. It's just an old car, you know. So it wears its uh, age well, I think. So oh, I, I think so. Yeah. So you're leaving it the way it is. So I think it's the most valuable the way it is. I think so. I mean, you could paint it and then somebody say, well, I don't like that color. So, you know, that's another 40 grand to redo, you know. Yeah. So... It's exactly what it is. It, right. And we have pictures of it at Riverside and I don't know. So Junior's House of Color is a, is a well-known painter in this area, in that Los Angeles area. And well, certainly in the 60s, and did all the hot rods. Right. You know, and Tony but now Nancy, he gets 100 grand a car to paint them. Something like that. You know, Tony Nancy was a, a huge hot rodder who had an upholstery shop, too. Right. And how'd you hear about this? I'm always curious about the little birdie told you. Do you remember? When you, when people know you know about things, yeah. they tell you things they know, you know. So most people I find just want their car to go to a good home. I mean, an awful lot of guys that didn't have children, the wife has passed away, and this is their last possession. And, you know, nobody wants to sell it and then see it on bring a trailer for three times the money and then they feel yeah. stupid, you know. Yeah. So uh, what I usually do is usually put pictures of the owners on the wall, and uh, you know, get a lot of people come by to see their grandpa's car, that oh, kind nice. of stuff. So I remember two phone calls you made to me about two different Duesenbergs, right. one in Burbank and one in New York City. Right, right, right. Are they here? They are here. Let's oh, take a look. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. Fiat? Lady bought that new in 59. Mm -hmm. She put it in her living room in 62. And it just sat there until I pulled it out in 2005 or six. Original paint, original interior, 
only had 5,000 miles when I got it. Now it has about 9,000 miles. Holy, so you've driven it. Oh, I drive it. It's a wonderful, you know, this is, if you were an Italian businessman, like a middle manager with a wife and two kids, oh, this is the car, it's fantastic. It would be like a, 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 a fair lane or a low model galaxy Italian version. Mm -hmm. You know, four speed on the column. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 it kind of dances down the road. It's a wonderful driving car, Isn't very nice? light. Yeah, nice. really terrific. 5,000 miles. Yeah, yeah. She had a party and somebody put a Coke can on the hood. She was very sorry about that. Oh, man. So people want to find good homes for their cars, and, and this is the home for many people. Well, I do hear from an awful lot of people like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, yes, the ultimate barn find. I forgot about ah. that. Right over here. This is the one interesting thing, well, not one, one of the interesting things about living in California. We're here at the Burbank Airport, and Lockheed Martin was right across the way where they developed a lot of planes. So you had a lot of engineers and technical people live in this area. Amelia Earhart's hangar is just a quarter mile down the road from here. She lived here. A lot of these kind of people. In fact, when you drive around here, you see little houses with enormous garages behind the houses. It's just airplane people, it's car people. This guy bought this Jaguar brand new in 63, put his garage in 67 or 68, just started drinking and pretty much drank himself to death. We died about four years ago now. And this was buried under tons, and when I say tons, not like, I mean literally 2,000 pounds, 4,000 pounds worth of, there was a water heater on top of it, ah. a broken console, television, a washing machine, everything was crammed in this jail. And the cops told me, told the lady, hey, Jay Leno was down the street. So I heard from them and they said, our uncle had this car. He had some kind of English car. We don't know what it is because he's just buried under everything. Okay, less than a mile from here. We went over there. We started moving stuff out of the way. This is what it was. It's got 17,000 miles. It's got the original exhaust system, original top, which has never even been down yet. We, so I'm going to put it and down. And the back there. window. Holy back. Back window is original plastic. Isn't that funny? Man. They, you, they usually turn foggy. Yeah, and, and, and original bumpers, original, I mean, the, the chrome look nice. This is what's nice about living in a desert, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's pretty cool. Here's something interesting about these cars. You know, most people, when they do a Jag, they do the wires and everything, but they forget about this phenolic piece of material here. Uh -huh. Okay, that's all original. Everything is all original. Original toolkit, original jack. Look at the interior. Look how nice That's the fabulous. leather is. I've and never seen a Jag interior like that color. I know, but this, this, this was called, um, this is some kind of go, opalescent sand was the name of this color. Everything works. The clock works. 17,306 miles. Yeah, the only thing I did to it, I was a little leery of wire wheels being, so we put just a little wire wheel on it so the tire has a bit more of a footprint, but I still have the original wheels. That's fabulous. How long do you have it? Well, I've had it about four years now. Mm-hmm. Just, just. A, so he, yeah, oil change sticker. You well, here's remember. what's interesting. See, the, these are the chalk marks oh, from, from wow. the factory. Man. Now, normally, if you lived in Massachusetts or even Texas, where it rains and what, all that would have washed off. But you're in a desert climate, so all of that stayed. So it, it's pretty nice. So uh, what did you have to do the engine to make it? Nothing. Did not nothing. Doing, no, I cleaned it, took it apart, cleaned it, pulled the rear end out, flushed everything, Man. new seals. That's about it. Man. Didn't replace the rope seal. Mm -hmm. in the back of the trance is still good, doesn't mm -hmm. leak. The only thing I replaced was this. It was, just had rust because it was parked wet, you know, yep, yep. and that was filled. So we just changed that tank, and I still have the original tank, but yeah. it, you know, I'm afraid it's going to be, become porous, but porous, but yeah, but, and it's, it's the right one you want. It's a 63 Series 1, so mm -hmm. it had whatever So 3.8, I guess. 3.8, yeah, mm -hmm. which a lot of people think is a much sweeter engine than right. the 4.2. I don't know how many times a day or a week Jay gives tours to people, but he's so accommodating to strangers or industry people, car company executives. Uh, and, and even though he's explained this car and that car and that car and that car, how many times over the course of weeks, days, months, years, decades, every time he explains it to somebody, he's like, it's like the first time he's talking, he's excited about it. Like when he showed us when this hood was up, the, the crayon marks that were put on at the factory were that if it were in another state, like uh, Rhode Island or New England, where the salt would have eaten up those crayon marks. But because this is 
an LA car, a desert environment, it's still there. He explained that to me like it was like I was the first person he was telling it to. He he loves this stuff, and I'm so happy that we have someone like him to uh, be kind of our our leader, our guide in the old car world because there could no not be anybody better than him. So and this was a barn find. Here was the Dame Le, well, they called it Dame Le Dart in England. They couldn't call it the Dart here because Dodge. Dodge had the Dart. It's fiberglass. It sat in the guy's backyard for years, just sat there. And of course, being fiberglass, it didn't rust. But the fun thing about this is this has an engine designed by Edward Turner, who did the Triumph Bonneville motorcycle. And the cool thing about it is it's a 2.5 liter Hemi. It came with a couple of Solexes on it. We just put the two barrel Weber on it. Uh, just put a Mitsubishi alternator on it because it weighs like five pounds less than the giant thing that was on there before. Are these, is that aluminum head? Aluminum heads, yeah, yeah. Wow. Hmm. But really fast. This, to me, it was the original Shelby Cobra. It was, in fact, when the London police wanted to catch motorcyclists, they bought, I think, 30 of these to catch the, the fast motorcycles, you know. Uh, and you did a ground up restoration on this? Ground up restoration, put a five speed in it, cleaned up the motor a little bit, uh, but yeah, but other than that, it's completely, pretty much completely yeah, stopped. You see this once in a while, but you never see them with a hard top. It was voted the ugliest car at the <laughs> auto show. It doesn't look bad. It, it has that English, it was built for the American market. Look, Nigel, put a bit of chrome on it, put some fins on it, put a big fin, put a big grill. America's like a big grill, like a Buick. You know, so it just has all these weird yeah, sort yeah, of, yeah. What do you think Americans are like? Americans are like a big grill, mate. We'll put a big grill on there, you know, like a V8, got a Hemi in it, you know. And, and it was, but the trouble was, uh, Jaguar had just bought Daimler. And Jaguar did not want this beating their XKE, because it actually had more horsepower and was faster and a V8 and smoother. So they, they, they stopped the sports car, but they kept the engine, they put it in the Daimler sedan, the, yeah. the small Jaguar. The, you either got the big six, or you get the 2.5 liter V8. Is that when the name Jaguar and Daimler became associated? Yeah, they... yeah, Jaguar bought Daimler yeah, wow. and just absorbed the company, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, that's a sweetheart. If you like these videos, you really should check out the Haggerty Drivers Club. You get 24 seven roadside assistance with flatbed towing, subscription to an award-winning magazine and more. Sign up today. The link is in the description below. Here over here is a really unusual barn find. This is uh, my shot well. This is built by a 17-year-old kid in 1931. Oh, God. What he were you doing you're 17? Well, that's what I mean. That's what people did before Netflix, you know. They would build stuff, you know. And he wanted a car, and his dad said, we can't, if you want a car, you're going to have to build it. So he and his dad went to a junkyard, got some Model A, Model T parts, some sheet metal, got a motorcycle engine from an Indian 4, put it in the back here. It's a three-wheeler, as you can see. And it's got these little wheels here to keep it so if you get a flat tire, you don't tip over. This is brilliant. Well, he built this in Minnesota. He and his brother went Minnesota to Alaska to uh, San Diego and then back to Minnesota. And he was a big, tall guy. Here he is here. Robert Schuster was his name. I never met him. I spoke to him. He was like 90 years old. They were taking him to an old folks home. And he was so afraid that motorcycle guys would come in the backyard, steal the engine and junk the car. He said, I'll give it to you if you promise to fix it. And that's it when you got yeah, it? Yeah, that, that's it when we got it. A little rough, a little uh -huh. rough. No, this, well, it was rougher than this. This is, he's still a fairly young man there, so it was pretty rough when we got it. But then I had that uh, actress, uh, I think Michelle Williams, you know Michelle Williams, the actress, Academy Award. I had her on the Tonight Show, and she said, hey, you got my grandpa's car. I go, who's oh. your grandpa? Oh, Bob Shaw. Oh, yeah, not funny, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, and it, I mean, it runs pretty good. That's a, so, I mean, they must have gone to a junkyard and bought a grill, because you, you can't make something like that. I don't know. Yeah. He might have made it. Why couldn't you make it? And is it metal? Yeah. Yeah, wow. I mean, you know, we make bodies here, mm -hmm. so we, you do metal shaping. Wow. And it's, it's a lost art. They knew more back then than they do now. This is a barn find out of Indiana, the Auburn. No yeah. kidding. Very fast car. This would have been the equivalent of a GTO. It's a V12 engine with a two-speed rear end. Lightweight body, de engine developed by Augie Duesenberg, overhead valves, quite fast for 1932. It didn't have the build quality of a Duesenberg, but it wasn't meant to compete with Duesenberg. This was $999 in 32. 
you know. But it was a gas eater, a V12 and a depression. That oh. was a hard sell. What a beautiful color combination. Yeah, it's kind of nice. Wow. This, so this is the famous doozy. Yeah, this is the 19th. This is the last car built by the Duesenberg brothers. They were working on this car when E.L. Cord walked in and said, guys, I'm buying you out. Finish that car. I want you to build the ultimate car. And they went to work on the Model J. This is called the Model X. It's not the same engine as a Model A. It's similar. It's single overhead cam, but a lot of different, a lot of improvements. The guy I got it from bought it. Uh, it's a 1927 model. He bought it in 46, I believe. Drove it out from Chicago, put it in his garage. There was some kind of earthquake and the garage settled and the door couldn't open. So it stayed shut pretty much to 2005. Wasn't and, it like here somewhere? Yeah, two miles from here, right around the corner. Huh. There was always talk this old guy had a Duesenberg in his uh, garage. He's like one of these real suspicious guys. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I would drive down the street in, his, in the Stanley steamers and blow the whistling wave. You know? Then you go down in another kind of old car. Yeah, yeah. So I, I got to be friendly with it. Very, his daughter called me and said, Grandpa said, if you want to buy what's in the garage. Imagine this. The granddaughter grew up in the house, had never been in the garage. That's how secretive he was. And in the garage, he had a Bitza Duesenberg engine and, and a Packard body. And he had this. And when I got this, it was filled with newspapers with headlines, you know, Japanese attack again, you know, this kind of stuff. And, and it, 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 it was a Burbank newspaper. And I'm, I'm looking at the paper, and there was a strip club in Burbank back in the 40s which, with, with the blonde bombshell. It was, it was just kind of interesting to read a little history of the area. But he never actually got it running uh, with the help of Randy Emo, who was the premier D Duesenberg expert. Uh, oh, it, it was too nice to restore. I mean, all the metal is strong. So you cleaned it up? Just cleaned it up, did the engine, did the transmission, did the brakes. And it runs and drives fine. And it's, it's sort of a gangsterish looking car. It's a very low roof, mm -hmm. although it seems high by modern standards. You realize they were usually much taller, usually right. taller than you are. Right. Yeah, so. But here, we can, I'll show you the motor if you want to see. Were they always bright green the motors? Uh, apple green was the color. Yeah. No, this was gray, as you mm -hmm. can see. Oh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. See, single overhead cam. Yep. Auto vac, everything is as it was. It was expensive. This is a. You notice the wood trim is kind of expensive looking and yeah, all yeah, of the, see yeah. the veneers and all this and the ornate handles. And it's a nice driver? Well, you know, it, it, the cool. fact that, that it drives at all, I think, is pretty cool is what's, mm -hmm. what's neat about it. And then, so the Duesenberg from New York City, is that here somewhere? Yes, it is, right down ah, here. That's, that's the first car you called me about that you had found. And the, and the, and you told me that's it's in a parking garage in Manhattan, but you can't get it out because the elevator, a new elevator was put in and the car's too big to get out of it. I said, crap, you can't get it out. So then you called me five years later and says, I got that Duesenberg. Oh, right, right. And I said, how'd you get it down the elevator? He said, oh, that was just a, a BS story, so right. nobody to go and buy it. Oh. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, this one has a story, too. This one? This is an all-original car. This is LeBaron barrel side. This was bought by a kid who was 17 years old in 1929. His grandfather left him $17,000, and he and the grandfather went down and bought this Duesenberg for $17,000. They drove it home, and the son, the son of the grandfather, mm -hmm. the father of the kid, furious that the grandfather squandered this money, cashed their stock in to buy this stupid car, threw them both out of the house. Well, two months later, the stock market crashed, and the stock was worthless. So William Ashton, that was his name, he had the car. So he had the car for about 20 years, and he sold it to a gentleman who was one of the first GIs into Berlin. And six of these guys went into the German banks and raided the German safe deposit boxes. They got a bunch of diamonds, all kinds of stuff, and they hid their booty in the chassis of a German motorcycle. Magola. The Magola, yeah. Welded up the Magola, left it in Germany. After the war ended, they went back to Germany. Oh, we bought a motorcycle. They imported it, cut the frame open, took the diamonds, bought this Duesenberg from Ashton, bought a huge estate in Connecticut, lived like a king. About a year later, got despondent over a woman, drove this into the barn, shut the door, let the engine run, died in the car. Right here. 
Yeah. Now his father, his brother, was so upset by this, he would never sell the car to anybody that knew the story. You know, hey, I'm a Duesenberg collector. I know your brother killed himself. No, not for sale, not for sale. So I'm at a motorcycle show once. I'm talking to the brother about motorcycles. And he got into old cars and, oh, I like Duesenberg. Oh, you do? Yeah, okay. we talk a little bit, you know. And he was amazed that I knew a lot of, not amazed, but he was interested that I knew a lot about Duesenberg. So I, I, I never knew the story of the brother. So I, 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 that's how I got it. Because he wouldn't sell it to anybody that knew the story. Because I met collectors that, oh, they wanted to buy this car because it's original engine, middle trend, everything's original. It's only got less than 50,000 miles on it, you know. So, and it, it runs fabulous. So, I mean, it, had to, it needed everything. Original color combination? I believe so. Wow. I think so you so. did a frame off on this? Yeah, the, yeah. Again, there was no, you could get any color you wanted with Duesenberg. So, but this is one of the few cars you can drive like a modern car. 80 on the freeway is no problem. I, I put 354 gears in them. I got rid of the 456s because that was, the idea in those days was you just put it in third gear and leave it there, come to a stoplight. Mm -hmm. The engine was open, you could pull away in third. It was like having an automatic transmission. But the car you were talking about, I had already heard a rumor there was a, a Duesenberg in a parking garage in New York City. It's one of those rumors you hear about, like, you know, the Corvette, the, the guy Corvette, died. The Corvette, the guy died, died. yeah. Yeah, yeah all that kind of stuff. Okay. So I actually went to the police station when I was a kid. Yeah. I heard you have a Corvette that a yeah. guy died in yeah. and it stinks too bad. And <laughs> <laughs> now we got rid of that one. Oh, oh that's funny. That's funny. Well, that's, what, that's, what, that's kind of what this was. So I'm in New York with my wife and she wants to go shopping. I said, well, you go shopping. I'll go. So I started in the village and I walked east to west. I hit every parking garage in New York. I got to West 57th Street. Looking for that car? Just you got any old cars here? Yeah. Well, Duesenberg and Rolls Royce. What? And there it was. It had been parked in 1931. It's the last original owner car to be sold. Herbert Hoover used this when he visited New York. Here's the story. Oh, look at that. Land's last original understory Duesenberg. There you go right there. That's what it looked like when I got it. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this was in one of my books. Yeah. And I wrote the story and you got sued over it? Yeah, I did. What happened was it was bought by the people who founded Macy's. They owed fees on it. So I told the guy who owned the parking garage, listen, let me know when it comes up for sale because I don't want to get in the middle of anything, yeah. okay? He said, we're accepting bids on it. Okay, so I bid 180, which seems ridiculous now. But at the time, it was a lot of money. Nobody wanted town cars, everybody wanted them. Okay, so mine was the highest bid. So I got it. I got it and I restored it. You know, took it to Pebble and all that. And then, oh, I got sued. You tried, you tricked my grandfather. Well, I never met the grandfather, you know, just always. So he said, I, I let the court settle, and the court said, no, you, you, you did the car. And after I won with it, it, at Pebble Beach an award with it, they said I ruined the car by, they sent an appraiser, I, said, I ruined the car by leaving it not in the original condition. But see, it had been parked under a hole in the roof, and the hole in the roof had eaten through a fender and eaten through the rear, I mean, it ah. needed a lot of metal. I and mean, it's not really an attractive car. We redid it. Uh, it was, you look, you see, it was done in what they call early bordello, as you can see. It just, <laughs> just oh, look at this. Oh, yeah. Holy I mean, mackerel. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of lipstick on a pig kind of thing, you know. I mean, it's an enormously heavy car. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go around a corner, whoa! I mean, you just feel the weight of it, but. It's so this, was a, you got this from the original owner, although he didn't know about it. Uh, he well, was, I, bought, I, I bought it from the garage. Who yeah, got, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he wasn't deceased at the time. And this one here was an interesting one, too. I think this is in your book, too, isn't it? This I don't one? think so. This one, uh, this was a tow truck. This had a rig in the back of it, but we managed to, to find the original plans and put it back the way it was. This was the most expensive Duesenberg ever built. This is the Walker Coupe. This is built for Josiah Lilly, Eli Lilly's son, the pharmaceutical magnet. He didn't drive, but he had a chauffeur. But so you're sitting like this with the in chauffeur. In a coupe. In a coupe. And plus, it's the middle of the depression. And people throw rocks. I'm like, yeah, rich bastard, you know, throw I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, if you look at it, it's just built to run over poor people. That was the idea. You just go out and you run over poor people with it, you know, and, and that's basically what it was. It's an odd design, the headlights. I mean, what well, year is this? It's aerodynamic. When you realize, Every Duesenberg was built in 1928, every single one, okay? They didn't, they didn't sell them by the year. 
it just took 10 years to sell them because they were so expensive. A Model T was $260, and this was $27,000. It would be like buying, buying a Bugatti Chiron in the middle of the Depression, you know? So that's pretty much where you were. Man. So there's, if when you look at it, when you realize these are all basically the same year, but this just looks like some Cruella de Vil car, you know? What are the cars you can think of that you've got like in rough? Oh, this was a barn find. Well, sure, this one. A Revere, never heard of it. See, this has a Duesenberg walking beam engine. You see this engine right here? That's a display engine. The way the walking beam works is mm -hmm. the cam is low in the block. The cam yep. is down here. Yep. You have overhead valves. This is the precursor to the uh, twin cam cars. Duesen built a hundred of these racing engines in the early teens. Every engine, not one came in worse than fourth place. They won every race because it, nobody had real overhead. The overhead cam came later and then it, it kind of started to beat these. But these were cast iron, they were bulletproof, there's no cylinder head, you can't blow a head gasket, you can't do anything. So they lasted forever. So they sold these engines to people who would put them in cars. Uh, Revere was one of them, and uh, Rensselaer, and a whole bunch of companies. But the guy that built these, it was kind of a scam. He started the company with Duesenberg racing engine and somebody else's four-speed transmission and aluminum case. And, and the idea was like the movie Producers, where you sell a bunch of stock, then you declare bankruptcy, and you keep the money. That's what he did. But it was a pretty good car. So he fled, and then he mysteriously died or was murdered in his hotel room. And then, there's, so there's, there's not, not a whole lot of reveres around. But this thing is really fast. I mean, this would be the equivalent of whatever, buying a Corvette or something nowadays Man. back in the team. I mean, it was fast, it had a four speed box, uh, had this over, overhead valve engine. It was really pretty cool. So this is a water pump that's connected right. to the generator, generator right. connected to, to the, the dynamo. Main, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, pretty, yeah. and it's all, is it driven off of this belt? No, yeah. I get it. Okay. Yeah. Ah. That yeah. is cool. But let's take a look at the Cunningham. So you did a nice job, I gotta say that. This is time to give you a free plug. What's that? About Leno's Garage. Right. Tell me about that. Hey, if you'd like to know more about Jay Leno's Garage, we're on YouTube, it's called Jay Leno's Garage. We have over 1,100 videos. It's hard to believe we got that many, but everything from Koenig's eggs to Wankel engines to Amphicars to Porsches to Ferraris. So check it out, I think you'll like it. We made these 15-inch reproduction wheels. I realized these had 16s originally with a little thinner tire, which I should have kept. But I was too leery of magnesium wheels yeah, yeah, yeah. being so old. You know, Gordon Murray hated magnesium wheels, and he's a pretty good engineer. I meet people say, oh, no, no problem, but I don't know. So anyway, that's what we did. But other than that, it's a 331 Hemi. This is what it came with. A Briggs Cunningham was he and his wife were the richest couple in America when they got married. He was a sportsman. He never had a job. Uh, he, he was uh, swift meat packing, I think. And uh, Procter & Gamble. Oh, Procter & Gamble. And she, she was, was Standard Oil. Standard Oil, right. <laughs> so they were hugely wealthy. And he wanted to win Le Mans with an American car, with an American driver. So he built these in West Palm Beach, Florida, as you can imagine. Uh, he got the bodies from... Uh, Vignali. Oh, uh, Vignali, that's right, yeah. Vignali. Fignale did it. It's a, basically a Ferrari body, it's just 10% bigger, like Americans are 10% bigger than Italians. That's kind of the way it was. It, they all had two-speed Chrysler transmission, which was horrible. So we, the other thing is we put a five-speed Tremec in here. Wonderful driving car, I mean, and the greatest dashboard. If you need your glasses to see this dashboard, you should not be driving. Just, I mean, big I giant lettuce. Yeah, take a look. So like, yeah, it's like a Ferrari dashboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Ferrari was not the Ferrari we know today. They were a company that needed money, and anybody who would buy a body, hey, you're more than welcome to it. And yeah, you did a wonderful job with this. And this yes. is the original combination. It was three-tone. Most Cunninghams were three-tones. Yeah, yeah. But expensive. This would be about 15 grand and 52. Price of three Cadillacs. Price of three Cadillacs. My, my parents paid 19,000 for their house in 59. So I know. Give I you know. some idea. So you, the engine's still the original 331 Hemi? The engine came with it. When it when left the factory, it had an engine. The engine was replaced within uh, like a year or two. And this is, it's, it's the engine that's been in it. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Terrific car. Mm. So the, the way it worked is the, the, the chassis is a racing type chassis that Cunningham built in Florida. They put the Hemi engine in it, usually mercury suspension, transmission rear end. And then they took that chassis and brought it up to New York 
put on a boat and took it to Turin, Italy, where Vignali built these bodies of aluminum. Right. And, you know, if you look at the Ferrari 212 of the same year, it was designed by the same guy, Mick Giovanni Michelotti. Right. It's like the Ferrari is, like Jay said, 10% smaller than this because the Ferrari had a little 12-cylinder and this has a huge V8. Yeah, I mean, the Ferrari was 2.5 liter. Yeah. And, and when I was a kid, I didn't understand what that meant, but you realize that's really tiny. Tiny, yeah. It's like, you know, you have like golf tees on the valves, you know. And I think that's about it. Oh, well, I guess this would qualify as a bomb <laughs> fine. A Packard-built Merlin engine oh. that we found. We sent it up to our buddies up at uh, V12 and Tapache. Tapache like he, they do aircraft engines. We had it rebuilt. It's not airworthy, but it's roadworthy. I mean, aircraft standard is a whole different standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we would not put this in an airplane, but we fire it up, and it's amazing how powerful it is when this... We put it on a truck, we put chocks on the truck, you rev it, and it actually pulls the truck, which is in park, over the chucks. I mean, yeah, I, so we cut the prop down a little bit to cut some of the power. So that's a Packard-built Rolls-Royce. Yeah. yeah, you know, this is amazing <clears throat> because the Rolls-Royce engines were done to imperial standards, English thread. There were no computers. They had to take these apart so they could build them I mean, the, the English probably built one a week. We had to build one an hour. So they had to redo the whole what thing. What year is this? This is about 38, 39. Yeah. So just before World War II. Well, World War II had started already in yeah. Europe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Jay, I mean, this is, this is one of the best Barn Fun Hunter episodes I've ever seen because the cars that Jay has found, he's had the wherewithal to mostly leave them alone and just fix them mechanically so they're good drivers and fun to own. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, the whole thing, if you can't use these for intended purpose, I mean, because when you get behind the wheel, you really get the sense of, because to me, when I was a kid, I just think, oh, the 50s must have been so boring. But then you realize it was really one of the most exciting periods. You had Hemi engines, you had just, the Hemi was the most powerful American engine since the Duesenberg. It was the wow. first one to make more horsepower than the Duesenberg. And so many people raced them and ran them, and then you had the Jags, the Maseratis, and all those great designs, you know, were, when, when people thought aerodynamics looked like was so much sexier than what aerodynamics really looked like. It looks like a teardrop, that, that's okay, yeah, or a raindrop. Yeah, yeah. But when you look at a, you know, a Maserati or a Ferrari, how exciting those cars were back in the day, because that was their idea of what, like people think a Countach is aerodynamic. A Volkswagen Bug is more aerodynamic than a Countach, but it, but it looks exciting. Right, know? right. Well, Jay, thanks for- Hey, thanks a lot. Thanks so much, and you know, happy hunting. Today's a good day.